Okay. Um, in more than one sense, this uh, presentation fits the conference's title, Dare the Dark Precursor. Um, perhaps it is daring not to talk about Deleuze, nor about artistic research. Uh, why not? Um, one of the things uh, Deleuze did for philosophy is to open the conceptual frameworks of philosophy by inserting words, insights, concepts, etc. from, among others, art. So in other words, I'm not here and I don't want to legitimize nor to explain artistic research through Deleuze. Perhaps I'm, I'm rather interested in the opposite, not what Deleuze's thoughts can do for artistic research, for music, but what artistic research in and through sound can do for Deleuzean thought. However, also this second question will not be explicitly addressed. Nevertheless, both Deleuze and artistic research could be regarded as dark precursors, specters that hound the thoughts I will present in a minute. Strange specters as they precede their concrete manifestation. So, not the specters that sometimes return to the world of mortals, marriages of the deceased, but specters that announce the future. Specters as harbingers. So my talk will be on, as you can see, sonic materialism, on SM. Uh, and indeed, I will torture myself as I have not really developed any elaborated thoughts on this topic yet. So what will follow are merely some precursory signs. Signs of sonic materialism of which Deleuze and artistic research are not so much dark precursors as noisy or at least audible or oral precursors. So what I hope to achieve is to expand, maybe augment, philosophical inquiries by letting sounds intervene in its discourse. Or to rephrase that, how do we grasp sonic events in thought and speech? So why bother about the ear? As we all know, our culture is the result of acts of inscription, of reading and interpretation. Acts within the domain of vision, visibility and perspective. These are the words by James Clifford, uh, written in 1986 in his introduction to writing culture. His words echo those of Michel Foucault, who stated in The Birth of the Clinic, that the eye that knows and decides is the eye, the eye, I mean that eye, that governs. The eye presents and represents intellect, abstraction and objectivity, whereas the ear is connected to immersion and subjectivity. Why bother about the ear? Although the dominance of the eye in Western history, philosophy, cultural theories and everyday speech is quite obvious. Words like alignment, perspective, vision, observation, visionary, point of view, reflection. Especially postmodernism and post-structuralist thinkers have lent an ear to the other, or as Deleuze would say, to a minor tradition in and of modern culture. That is, they have discovered the other senses, especially the ear and the use of auditory concepts. 
Martin Heidegger writes about Stimmung being attuned. Jacques Derrida about non-discursive sonority. Gilles Deleuze about the refrain. <coughs> However, in my opinion, these philosophers remain as deaf, as silent, as the ones they are opposing against. Derrida admits that he's lacking competence to speak about music, and that music and philosophy are separated domains. <coughs> So why bother about the ear? Well, perhaps to understand the impact and the importance of sound for our culture. To acknowledge the effective working of sounds on living beings. To investigate how sonic marks consciously and, and unconsciously guide human behavior. The move I'm making here is from sound as an object of study, the results of which can be articulated through texts, words, existing concepts, to sound as a medium through which one can understand our being in the world. Sound as a possibility to conceptualize new ways of knowing a culture and of gaining another understanding of how members of a society know and relate to one another. However, my aim is not to propose a counter-monopoly of the ear. I conceive of the senses as an integrated and flexible network. Human perception is always synesthetic. All senses influence one another. In other words, I want to replace the dichotomy between the eye, the modern eye, and the pre- or anti-modern ear by a more nuanced approach. Still, more attention for the sonic aspects of our culture is needed. So, what does it mean to do or think or feel in and through sound, sounding, becoming sound? So, some background noise. First, uh, Manuel de Landa. De Landa's new materialism <coughs> proposes a philosophy which, which must take as its point of departure the existence of a material world that is independent of our minds. It is a non-anthropocentric materialism based on the idea that matter has morphogenetic capacities of its own. This implies a rethinking of the subject. Subjective experience is not organized conceptually by categories, but composed of a dynamic of perceived intensities. Color, sound, aroma, flavor, texture. And besides this, we need to replace the reified generalities with concrete assemblages. Many musics, many noises, many sounds. Variations in human experiences don't come from differences in signification, a linguistic notion, but of significance. Different cultures do attribute different importance, relevance or significance to different things simply because their practices and not their minds are different. The second one, Peter Sloterdijk. In Wo sind wir, wenn wir Musik hören, Sloterdijk asserts a spatial chasm between the subject that sees and the object that is seen, an ontological chasm. The ocular subjectivity implies a not involved witnessing, distance, an external relationship. Seeing, the seeing subject is located at the edge of the world. 
The ear has no opposite, according to Schlotterbach. No frontal sighting of an object located at some distance. Sloterdijk refers here to Martin Heidegger's inter esser, to be among things. Listening means being in sound, being amidst the acoustic event. It is about a contact that goes beyond the control of the eye. The third background noise comes from François Laruelle, French philosopher. According to him, it is the pretension of philosophy to elevate itself above any object in order to offer a philosophy of it. A philosophy of science, a philosophy of art, a philosophy of music. Philosophy claims the ability to reveal what the object itself cannot reveal about itself, its essence, its nature, or its fundamental reality. Philosophy thus dominates the object, subjecting it to philosophical rules. Convinced that its object is fundamentally ignorant about itself, philosophy is little concerned with what that object has to say on its own behalf. So, how might one challenge the domination and allow sound to speak? What would it mean to think sonically rather than merely to think about sound? How can sound alter or inflect philosophy? What concepts and forms of thought can sound itself generate? These are the questions I want to address here. And my aim is to track some of the ways that philosophy has or could be affected, infected and inflected by sound to produce not a philosophy of sound or music, but a sonic philosophy, a sonic materialism. Of course, sonic materialism can be connected to certain forms of representation, signification, and realism. I hear the siren of 
of a police car, the sound of a dishwasher, the national anthem before a football match, the squeaking of the trams. However, sonic materialism also exceeds representation, signification and realism. Sonic materialism not only investigates what is, but what can be, the possibilities which are felt and lived between the listener's primordial perception, regarded as an openness to the sonic world, and reflection. And perhaps this happens first of all in and through sounding art. So, what I'm introducing here is an extra actor. Besides the sounds, there is the listener who gives voice to the actuality and possibility of the material in the contingent experience of the herd, of concrete experiences. Listening is participating. In listening, hearing and auditory imagination, actuality and possibility exist in a critical equivalence. In other words, bringing in imagination and possibilities does not work in opposition to reality, but as a pluralization of that reality. In that sense, sound worlds are not fictional worlds. They rather make us aware of the plurality of the world. So the first thing I have to say on sonic materialism is that it doesn't lie in the objects, nor in the subjects, but in their relationships, in their reciprocity, through which sense is made of the material world. Sonic materialism is not separate from us, nor made from abstract entities. It comes into existence through our inhabiting of the sonic events. Sonic materialism implies a permanently present action of connecting, deconnecting, and reconnecting. The sonic event is not autonomous, but appears through interaction. Sonic materialism begins not from music of sounds as a set of cultural objects, but from the experience of sound as flux, event becoming movement. Therefore, a rethinking of the concept of material, of matter, of materialism is needed. When we speak of matter, we, te we usually tend to think of it as solid matter. An attention to sound, then, will provoke us to modify our everyday ontology and our common sense conception of matter. Sounds lends credence to a different sort of ontology and materialism. Sounds are not bodies, no punctual or static objects. They are temporal, durational flaws. 
they thus accord with an empirical account of events and becomings as processes and alterations. And beyond this empirical sense, sounds are also events and becomings in another sense, a pure, <coughs> incorporeal, or ideal sense. Different from conceptual art, which pursued a dematerialization of the art object by way of the concept, the idea, language, discourse, sound art extended the notion of matter as a profusion of energetic fluxes. Sounds joined the profusion of flows catalogued by Manuel de Landa in A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History, in which he conceives of nature and culture as a collection of flows, flows of lava, genes, bodies, language, money, information, etc. The sonic flux could just be another one. So, my second idea about sonic materialism is thus that sound affirms an ontology of flux in which objects are merely temporary corrections or concretions sorry, of fluid processes. The flux ontology replaces the objects with events. From sounds, for sounds are peculiarly temporal and durational, tied to the qualities they exhibit over time. Sounds are not static objects, but temporal events. On a linguistic plane, we should give priority to the verb, which is no longer conceived as subordinate to the noun. Return to the interaction between sound and listener. Yeah. Sound and music are sensory materiality, both oral and tactile, as it is first of all experienced through vibration. Low frequency turns the body into a resonating chamber, generating for example, motion sickness. Extreme levels of volume can create the same effect. High volumes, infra and ultrasound work on the body, the body with organs.
in a less extreme sense, sounds is able to affect sound as sound. The scream, the howl, the sob, the sigh, they are outside language, par ergonal, peripheral, yet expressive. So the influence of sound is cultural, but also pre-cultural, hardwired, constrained biologically. Solid materialism works on the physical, psychological, as well as cultural level. So my third statement is that sonic materialism is not only, and maybe not even primarily, about sense and meaning, but also, maybe primarily, about sensibility. So beginning from a fascination with sound, we encounter a world in which bodies are dissolved into flows. Objects are the residues of events and effects are unmoored from their causes to float independently as virtual powers and capacities. The conception of the sonic flux and the ontology of events and effects it affirms is strange. It unsettles our ordinary ways of speaking, of sensing, of conceiving. And the philosophical, the philosophical aesthetics that approaches sound and music with the conceptual apparatus already in place will reject this or be deaf to it. Thank you for this great performance. At some points I had a feeling we were also facing a manifesto or something. Uh, how do you relate this, this free performance with the, the, the power of this kind of old-fashioned manifesto? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, I, I don't know if it's old-fashioned, <laughs> but it's, um, it's certainly um, a criticism to, uh, to many philosophers, uh, which... Uh, have managed for so many years to ignore uh, what sound can do and how sound um, affects our, what I call, being in the world. And although people, philosophers, as I mentioned, several of them have addressed and have used concepts, um, nevertheless, I think they, uh, they did that in, uh, in silence. Um, because it's very well known that many, most philosophers um, have some kind of aversion when sound enters their study and uh, 
can work uh, because thinking should go on uh, in mere concentration, which means usually outside or um, not disturbed by any sound. So in that sense, it is a manifesto and it's trying to, um, to pay attention to something that is ignored in Western cultural theories for so long. So there's a political dimension here, or ethical dimension. I see so many questions, I don't know where to start. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, to my understanding, your presentation uh, resonates very well with uh, the very um, distinctive um, publication that was um, published by Christoph Cox a couple of years ago, uh, Beyond Representation, or Beyond Signification, Beyond Representation, to work to some materials where he clearly draws the line going from Nietzsche to the song to the uh, understanding life and also sound in terms of his life. So I'm wondering how you relate to his thoughts in your presentation. Yeah. It was a bit late, so maybe I uh, came too late for that. Yeah, yeah of course, uh, many uh, voices can be heard here, uh, one of them being uh, that of Christoph Cox. Um, Never, uh, and yeah, so I, I took a lot of inspiration from his work. Um, the only thing that I, um, what I tried, and it was very briefly, I touched upon it very briefly, is um, that he is, I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that, um, I, I think he's, he's very specifically addressing sound art, whereas I think that, of course, and that's, that's what I also said, that sound doesn't only go, does not only go beyond representation and signification. I mean, we are often dictated by what we hear. So it has meaning for us, concrete meaning. So you are, in a way, um, forced to act when you hear the sound of your microwave, or of your child, or what, whatever it is, any sounds. So, I mean, that is not beyond representation. So in that sense, Mine could be, could be a kind of milder form of what Christoph Cox uh, tries to present. Although I say simultaneously, there is something beyond that world, beyond that world of representation. Sound has more to say than only that. But I, can, I, I didn't want to exclude it from uh, how we relate to the world. So sound it has an important, um, for, is an important force, an important actant in the way that we behave. Okay, just have to give some order, Vincent. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, which, on the one hand, kind of exemplified, but on the other hand, also problematizes, I think, the point that you're trying to make. Because if I understand you correctly, your main aim was to investigate how sound can inform philosophy, right? That was the aim. And um, which is, of course, a very ambitious aim, and I'm afraid also an aim that is not really, let's say, achieved in your presentation in the sense that uh, at least I have a feeling that, uh, that your, the thing that you accomplished was actually coming up with a philosophy, a philosophy of sound that informs philosophy. In other words, you needed to come up with concepts and ideas regarding the sound, how it plugs and the other things that you meant to understand. And through that lens, so to speak, you could look at philosophy. And I think also one of the telling moments in which I really thought, damn, it's really difficult to let sound inform philosophy, was at some moments that really the sounds that emanated from the speakers obscure, obscure the things that you were saying. Which of course was, I think, at least to an extent, intentional, intentional. But at the same time it showed, yeah, I can listen to these sounds, but that doesn't let me inform about philosophy, about ideas, whatever. I need your voice, I need your concepts in order to be able to do so. so intermittent steps, so to speak, of your concepts by which you try to make, make sense of the sound through this sensory materialism, that may help you understand other philosophy, but sound itself, not yet at least. Okay. Uh, yeah, of course, it's a very good and legitimate and it's a very difficult question. Mm -hmm. um, as I said already in the beginning, I mean, I'm it's my first try to, to, to come up with other ideas. Um, 
Um, and, I mean, in, in a way, it is very hard to, uh, to speak non-conceptually. Uh, it's, it's very hard not to use concepts when you're speaking. So, in that sense, it's unavoidable that uh, as long as you're using language, that you make use of concepts. Um, nevertheless, what I tried um, to do, uh, not only in these, um, in these moments where the sound coming from the speakers was interrupting or interacting, or, um, my, my speech, my words, the concepts that I used, but um, I tried to open up, or to, to propose to open up a world uh, when I introduced the idea of, of the imagination. Perhaps there is no imagination possible without concepts either, but at least there um, I could go beyond a kind of depiction of, or representation of reality, but to multiply that reality because it is inevitable that your own <coughs> imagination will become part of the way you perceive it. And I try to, in a way, to stimulate that, even perhaps to provoke that, in, uh, by, by ad addressing that issue. Um, and by, at that moment, letting sound speak as they can speak. So where you are actually forced, maybe informed by what was going on before, by the context, but nevertheless letting your imagination work on the sounds. Therefore also the question, what, what is that you didn't hear that was nevertheless present? I think these, I mean, it's, it's a rather strange question actually, but perhaps it makes you think in a different way about how the sounds were influencing what you were experiencing at that moment. Thank you. Clear and Julia. Yeah. You said that uh, your uh, sonic materialism is somehow based on the relationships. Uh, and uh, my question would be, how do you see then the relativity that brings it within, based, uh, being based on relationships? What role does the relativity play in your concept of materialism? Um, relativ relativity presupposes that there is also some kind of absolutism. And that is what I will firmly reject. If, if that ends up necessarily in relativism, I, I'm not sure. But that things happen in relation, that things come to existence, that you as a subject also comes, comes into existence, not because you're already there and then interacting, but that you come into existence because you are interacting, that is something that I wanted to state here. So there is nothing that precedes interaction. Things come into existence through interaction. And yeah, that there are many, I mean this plurality of the world that I was uh, talking about is, um, I mean not even subjective in the sense that it's, uh, that it's owned by a subject, but it is, uh, and, and because that would make the subject into a coherent whole, but even that I would contest and say, yeah, things are happening in experiencing something. And this is partly because we are embodied, so, and <coughs> set in, a cert in certain circumstances with our body, that's the third part. But again, I'm coming back also to the use of imagination, which of course is constantly at work. So constantly we are perceiving things in a different way. So, yeah, I mean, to call it relative, um, at least there's no absolute, absoluteness. Martin. Um, okay, so um, just in defense of philosophy for a minute, <laughs> some sort of music or 
sometimes composers take up significant residency in the work. So Beethoven for um, uh, Schopenhauer and Mozart for Kierkegaard, you know, Wagner for Nietzsche, etc. And we're coming out here with a little bit of Deleuze if the virtual um, sort of potentiality is to be taken seriously. But, but the interesting way in which music and sound takes up this, this residency in philosophy, which I think is consistent with, is that it seems to make a, a fairly sharp distinction between signification and non-signification, non and then you go into the in-between zone or somehow something like that. And what's interesting is that it sort of um, John Winslow talks about an audio-visual litany, where on the one side, you know, the eye does this and the ear does that. The eye is perspectival, the ear is immersive, objective, subjective, evidentiary, non-evidentiary. In other words, evidence can be made more by the eye than by the ear and so on. But I think that there's a long tradition of exactly the opposite happening all the time in Western society and in courtrooms and so on. The ear is a significant site of evidence. Uh, the Oscar Pistorius case recently, all of it was done on the basis of what the neighbors heard and not only what they heard in terms of what it signified, but the affect. Was it intense? Was it desperate? Etc. So it was actually even more than that. Um, and so, and Howard Dean, the president who ran, uh, who tried to run for president some years ago, um, it was in fact a primal scream into the microphone that sidelined his presidency. <laughs> Why? Because in Schopenhauerian fashion, we were all like little Schopenhauerians. Suddenly, on Fox News, they ran it as a gif, and this scream sidelined his presidency because it registered the true truth about this man that he was somehow didn't have the correct comportment. It was radically unspecified and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is this virtual potentiality is in fact not as virtual and not as uh, flux-like as it would like to be. In fact, it signifies, because it is mysterious in the most absolute way, that is where the fascism is. It was unaccountable site, uh, 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 unaccountable evidence. It was a site of pure fraud. And it was fraud because there's this tradition of thinking about sound as being always slipping away from the signifier. So it doesn't have to explain itself. And so that is, that's where I'm sort of saying, well, wait a minute, maybe we need a kind of philosophy that doesn't allow itself this excessive moment of sliding, slippery, this potential power, capacity, etc., to do strange things because of the potential fascism by which it signifies in a fraudulent way. Um, I've, I've, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I have three, uh, three things to say. Um, first, I, uh, I tried at least to, to be very explicit that I'm not aiming for a counter-monopoly of the ear. Uh, so I was saying that all experience is multisensorial. So nevertheless, I'm <coughs> addressing the ear more in particular. But I think that was an important remark that I made. Um, the second thing, um, and that also relates to previous question, I said, well, that is where, where I deviate a little bit from Christoph Cox, because for me, sound indeed uh, often signifies and has significance. So, um, that's, so I, I think I made several remarks there where my position is in defense of, um, so of what, you, what you're saying. Now, the third thing is, is, is this uh, Pastorius um, case. Um, it, it was a very difficult case because the only evidence that they had were the sounds. And that made it particularly difficult. Which means that, and there comes this third element in, of imagination was needed in order to actually compose a story which made uh, enough sense for both the judges and the jury and the, the one who was accused, etc., in order to finally condemn him, which is now, I think, I mean, they're changing the ideas again. Uh, he's released, I think, in, in the meanwhile. But anyway, so it is precisely because the only thing that was available were the sounds that, that they had to create, like, what could have happened. And I guess it would, be, would have been completely different if it would have been filmed.
this materialism uh, picked up, I think there was some spectral sort of frame freezing of your voice, which is a very difficult process. Uh, it's actually impossible to me in any kind of real material way. Um, so I'm wondering, personally, so I'm curious about this, what's the, uh, the strictly digital, discrete processes? Where does that belong? Um, it's, that, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. Well, perhaps that is a question which should be addressed to Kua, um, who uh, processed this uh, and who came up with the ideas on the basis of what I tried to present. So I don't know if he has something to say about uh, what he did and why he did it this way. sensations in the digital because I see in composition is used a lot and uh, there's also talk about ontology of sound. I'm just wondering in this framework that you presented, does the digital bother at all or not? Um, I'm, I'm, for me it was not specifically about the digital which is so important for me. Um, it was what, what I try to do, and, and that, that is something that, that is coming back in, in almost all of my work, is I'm, I'm, I'm constantly struggling with, um, from, from the, my very first um, um, publications and, and presentations, how, how to talk about music or about sound, which I find, find very, very difficult. Um, to, I mean, it's so easy that, that words, I mean, take over, explain, um, frame, contextualize the music and thereby give it some kind of meaning. And what I'm, what I was trying to do <coughs> here in collaboration with, with Juan is at least in certain moments that the sound could take over and could not only disrupt or interrupt or, or uh, uh, obscure or um, that what I wanted to say, but to give it, to give the space of its own where maybe it's not that the, the sound or, or that the, 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 the text is framing the sounds, but the other way around, that the sounds are actually used as a frame 
for the text I wanted to present. Does that somehow answer your question? So I'm, I'm trying to find, find a balance, trying to find, constantly find a, a, a language or a non-language or a non-linguistic language to, to give space for sounds and to see how that works outside or beyond the linguistic <coughs> concepts that are inevitably used when you speak. me this question in five years from now. <laughs> um, um, but, uh, but I, uh, my, my problem with, with uh, new materialism, uh, people like Delanda and Meseu and uh, Braidotti, um, is that, that also there, like with so many others, sound is, is absent. I mean, they, they speak about it, uh, they, they, but they turn it into an object, which you can, so, I, I think that is where, where the criticism of Laruel. Sorry, if I can just say something. Yeah. I think in this book in particular, there, is quite a, there are quite a few um, people talking about, actually talking okay, about I, I have Okay, I haven't read the book, so perhaps this will be an absolute ear opener for me uh, when, when I see it. Uh, um, but, uh, what I'm what I'm particularly interested in is is the the epistemological value of sound. So what does what can it teach us? What can what, what kind of knowledge can we gain from sound? <coughs> um, so that is what 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 keeps me from the street these uh, <laughs> days. Let's say years and also years to come. Um, so, um, in that sense, yeah, materialism is, is something that touches upon us. I mean, yeah, we have to rethink the idea of materialism when it comes to sound. Um, and also, I mean, I don't want to say that I'm against philosophy, <laughs> I mean, on the, on the contrary, but my idea is more, like what I said before, is that I, I would try to prevent from sound being no, an object of study, but what it can say itself as a, as a source of knowledge, a source of making us relate to the world. So that, that, that for me is the most important, so the epistemological uh, ground that, that is present. Um, actually, I, I've never thought if there is any relation to sensory ethnography. Um, could be, uh, perhaps, yeah. Um, yeah, what, what, what am I doing with it? Uh, <laughs> uh, um, 
listening, reading, writing, uh, thinking, um, presenting. Uh, what what kind of answer would satisfy you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, what is what is the the, the underlying? I, I mean, I mean the kind of more specific <coughs> areas that are there in, in, in the, that you could go with the sound materialism. Like I'm very interested in the friction, the pain and pleasure in friction as heard, for example, with some specific material that mm. you might not have. So. Yeah, that, I don't know if that will answer your question, but um, at this very moment I'm, I'm planning a larger research program on the influence of uh, sound in um, urban areas, uh, public urban areas, um, because also there, I mean, it's it is silent among architects and urban planners and uh, policy makers. Um, so, of course, when, when you um, reorganize an urban space, then a lot of attention is paid to how it looks and maybe how it feels, like tactility, at least about sizes, etc. But also sound is absent there. And um, I think it's, as it's, it is my opinion that sound contributes very much to a certain ambience, how you feel in a certain place. Uh, I think it's very, very um, necessary that in an early stage of urban development or reorganization that people are um, dealing with sound uh, and I think they're especially of uh, sound artists can have a voice in how how these uh, spaces are developed or redeveloped or constructed. So that is the most practical thing that I'm working on at the moment. And the last question for the new question. Hi, and thanks for really playful and fun presentation. Um, and this question I ask, I should apologize beforehand because unlike my colleague behind me, I'm not a mathematician, a metaphysician, or a musician. So. Um, but I'm, I'm relieved. <laughs> but I'm wondering, it struck me that in the performance, the use of reverberation um, and the, the, the question of echo, and it seems to me, that is there not perhaps a particular kind of possibility with the ontology of the echo? What, and I particularly not thinking it as an analogy of reflection, but as something else. And I'm just wondering about the ontology of the echo as maybe possibly being one of the best sites to start to work with Deleuzian uh, frames, you know, mm. repetition, difference, intensity. But also, I'm wondering if perhaps echo maybe also perhaps problematizes potentially the representation, non representation, signifying, non signifying border. It, it, I'm just wondering if this, this has been treated. Is this something you work with? Is this something other people in the room work with? The ontology of the echo? Yeah, I'm not working with it, but I'm thinking very hard now because I, I mean, it's not the first time that I hear, of course, about, uh, about the echo. Um, so like I said, I'm, it's, it's not on my radar at, at the very moment. Um, I could, I could very well imagine that it has something to do with the idea of repetition and difference, uh, for, for example. But uh, the, actually the, o the only thing that I wanted to say is that, um, I mean, for, for, for me, uh, using, for example, the word echo is, is not, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not after finding an opening to connect to the Deleuzean philosophy. I mean, I don't care, basically. Um, I'm interested in sound and if I can use or maybe better misuse concepts which are somehow giving uh, a certain uh, way of access of expressing uh, to express myself then I, I take these concepts and I reformulate I reuse them and like I said I misuse them but I'm, I'm not in that 
in, in any sense to, to Deleuze. That's why I said actually I'm more interested in what sound as sound can contribute to Deleuzean philosophy as the other way around. I suppose I, what I would propose is that you, 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 if you try to posit a non-differentiated non generality sound, that you're immediately in trouble. Yes. And, and that may be if to make a distinction between repeating a note on the piano or the reverberations that are produced in the modulating of the digital sample um, and the idea of echo, that in order to, to, to just coherently be able to operate that distinction, you might have no choice but to appeal to something like a Deleuzean or some other mm. ontological model, yeah, some yeah. other metaphysical model that will enable you to do that. Well, I, I, I mostly agree with the first part of what you were saying, that in, instead of using these generalities of sound or philosophy or, or any, I mean, that is, that is, of course, one of the main problems with concepts, <coughs> that, that they have some, some kind of generalization, whereas uh, um, I, I'm very much in favor of, of being very precise, very particular, very singular about which sounds, where, how, um, so I, I think that is, that is indeed very important, something that I didn't touch upon in, in this lecture, but if you want to read my forthcoming book on improvisation, <laughs> there it's, it's called uh, Complexity and Singularity, and I'm constantly quarreling with a lot of people dealing with improvisation who say that, yeah, so I say that improvisation is available, is, is present in all music making, and then say, well, that's far too general, I say, no, that's not general, you have to be very specific because it happens each time differently. So I fully agree with you that that should also be the case with sound studies. Um, if that inevitably, inevitably will bring me to use the Deleuzean concepts, well, per perhaps, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm personally, I, 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 I did some things with this uh, Derrida in non-discursive sonority, which I think is also a very interesting concept to you. So. I mean, there are other ways, uh, and I mean, I mean, isn't it time to, to also go a bit beyond the illusion? I mean, yeah. and it's certainly time to go for lunch. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.